Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends. I am John O'Leary, and I'm so happy to have you here joining me in the Live Inspired movement. On every Live Inspired podcast episode, we have amazing guests join us to share their story, their successes, their failures, their lessons, their lives. Most importantly, though, you'll walk away with real ideas, practical mindsets, and actions to apply in your own life. Before we get started, you should check me out on Facebook and Twitter. Like those pages, follow me there, and get inspiration throughout your week. I share weekly blogs and vlogs and quotes, uh, funny stories, personal reflections. So if you like the podcast, you'll love those daily moments too. Check it out at JohnO'LearyInspires.com. That's JohnO'LearyInspires.com. Almost 10 years ago, I read a book with a most unusual name, but an unforgettable message called The Fred Factor. It was written by a speaker, a trainer, an author who I've come to respect and really look up to as uh, as a guy that I want to imitate and emulate. His name is Mark Sanborn, has written and co-authored more than eight books, dozens of videos, audio training programs on leadership, change, teamwork, and customer service. He's presented more than 2,500 times, spoken in every state. You don't need a title to be a leader. Spoken all around the world. As a matter of fact, I would suggest that before we can ever hope to be titled leaders, we must first be untitled leaders. So the question becomes today, what makes for a titled or untitled leader? I want to suggest to you today that a leader, titled or untitled, always increases ROI. And you're familiar with ROI as a financial term, return on investment. But today I want to use it differently. I believe ROI stands for relationships, outcomes, and improvements. He's a friend, he is a colleague, and today I have the honor of introducing him to each of you. So my friends, buckle up, open up your minds, open up your hearts, open up your journals as we welcome to the Live Inspired community, my friend, Mark Sanborn. Mark, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you, John. Well, you're very kind, and uh, you're a rock star. I've watched uh, your career and the great impact, the positive impact you have on others, so it's a, it's a treat to be on the show with you. Well, I, you know, to be honest, when I read your book, I did not know what I was moving toward could be a career. And uh, in following your work and your writings and then your videos and now your website, I, I've realized what's possible, and it's deeply inspirational, and, and that's part of the story that I want to share with your community today and ours. So, Mark, for those who don't know the name The Fred Factor and all the other works that you've been part of, or they may not know the name Mark Sanborn, tell us a little bit more about you today. Well, I guess what's important to understand is it wasn't until I'd probably written my fifth book that I saw the underlying theme of my work. Um, Although my uh, focus is in leadership development, helping leaders at every level turn the ordinary into the extraordinary, I realized that the underlying theme of my books, even though they may have been on different topics, is this, and that is nobody can prevent you from choosing to be extraordinary. Mm. That's really what my my business, my writing, my speaking, my, my life is about, trying to encourage others and help others by giving them tools to be extraordinary. And what's interesting to me is that it came out of a really ordinary beginning. I grew up on a dairy and crop farm in northeast Ohio, And as a result, I was a member of a a youth organization called 4-H. Now, today, I actually think there are more uh, urban members of 4-H than rural. But, you know, back then, this was a long time ago, John, it was mostly a rural organization. And they needed somebody to represent the club in a speaking contest. And just to give you a little context, I was a an overweight kid who did well in school, and that meant I got beat up a lot. You know, I mean, that was kind of the uh, the trifecta for uh, challenging childhood. But the one thing the club figured is, hey, the fat kid can memorize the, the speech, right? So yes. they volunteered me. And I remember thinking, and how often, John, have you been at a point in your life where you thought, how hard can this be? 
And the answer is really, really hard because I I bombed so badly in my first little five-minute speech that I really got to a decision tree that only later in life did I realize was critical for what I I did uh, in my life. And that is, you know, when you're disappointed, you either say, well, you know, forget it. Got the T-shirt, done that, next, right? And whenever somebody says it doesn't really matter – yeah, usually it does, but it's a way to minimize your disappointment. I don't know. I guess I was lucky, maybe good parenting. Uh, for whatever reason, I made a different decision, and I said, this matters a lot. I want to learn to speak. I want to understand the skills of how to write and deliver a, a, a winning speech. And so really, it was out of that abject failure that I got interested in public speaking. And now these many, many years later, it's how I make my living. And I always tell people, we don't learn nearly as much, if anything, from our successes. We enjoy our successes, but we learn a whole lot more from our setbacks and challenges. Uh, you know, I'm curious, Mark. I, I had not heard that story. What was it about your your flop, five-minute flop as a 10-year-old, overweight, pudgy kid, that <laughs> made you realize this thing that you seemingly were so lousy in might end up having a, a future calling in your life? Well, probably part of it was, you know, I was pretty tired of being humiliated, you know, for my lack of athletic prowess or my my weight. And uh, the other part of it was, I, I thought I'm always I've always been pretty good at things you could think your way through, you know. And I realized that speaking was at at some level a thinking sport, mm-hmm. right? You have to design and and choreograph, if you will, and and learn the skills. So it was a combination of those two things. I, and I I don't know, John, I I really. I, I think if I had, you know, just said, well, boy, I don't ever want to do that again, you know, maybe today I would be an engineer or a lawyer right. or who knows. But I'm just grateful that uh, I decided that I wanted to learn the skills. I always tell people, look for, you know, look for that pain in your life because often, not always, but often there's a hidden opportunity there. You mentioned uh, kind of in passing that maybe I had some good parenting as a kid. I, I, I imagine that you had some profoundly important parenting. T- tell me a little bit about your mom and dad. You know, my mom and dad were very old-fashioned in that they were big believers in commitment and, uh, and hard work. You know, having grown up on a farm, I don't ever remember anybody asking me if I wanted to bale hay or milk <laughs> right. cows or feed the livestock. You know, today you ask your kids to take out the garbage, and an hour later you're, you're not sure whether they did. So I, I really lucked into that work ethic that if I if I could have done something a little different for my own kids, who are now almost 17 and, and uh, 20, it would have been, you know, to give them that same opportunity to just kind of take – as an accepted fact that you were going to work every day at something beyond school. Yes. Uh, And I've tried to instill that work ethic, but like I said, a farm is a little different environment to learn it. And, you know, my parents, uh, they always supported me. That was a a critical factor. They never, they never forced me to pursue something, but they always supported me in whatever I was interested in. You know, and how that panned out for me as a parent, my wife Darla is we wanted our kids to try as many different things as they could, and if they liked it, to keep doing it, and if they didn't like it, you know, to, to, to find something they did like. Because I think that's so important. Kids sometimes feel pressure to do something mom and dad approve of or want them to do. And certainly, I'm not talking about issues of integrity or character, but I'm talking about hobbies and career choices. So our strategy was try lots of things. The stuff you enjoy, stick with it. Mark, Three summers I spent in high school working a farm, and uh, since I, I retired from farming as a 18 year old boy, I, <laughs> I haven't worked since. Man, like th- that, there's not work like farm work. There's nothing like it in the world, for better and for worse. It's very taxing and extraordinarily rewarding. But I, I've been told by friends who are dairy farmers that as difficult as farming is, there's nothing like dairy farming. The the, the early mornings and the late nights, and there are no weekends. So. Growing up on a dairy farm, what what were some lessons that you learned that you're still applying today? I learned not to be a dairy farmer. Um, (laughs) You know, I like you, I retired. Cows don't take vacations. (laughs) And we had a small dairy farm. Frankly, um, it was a family farm, and and it was at the time where we would have needed to get really big to have been successful. My grandfather and father farmed together, and my dad had a full-time job in uh, ag finance. So, 
It wasn't necessarily a choice, but you're right. Uh, back then, we didn't have herdsmen. You have to have a pretty big farm and a pretty good herdsman to, to trust them to take care of the cattle while you take a, a week mm-hmm. or two vacation once a year. Um, but And I loved agriculture. I got my degree in ag economics, and you don't ever leave agriculture, um, you know, it always stays with you. I, I'm certainly not up to speed as I once was about both national and global ag issues, but I, I know a whole lot more than the average person, and I still have a great, great respect for anybody involved in agriculture, whether it be production farming or agribusiness. Well, you mentioned you realized on that farm you did not want to stay on the farm for long. When, when did you realize that you were called to not just give great five-minute speeches for the 4-H Club, but uh, to turn this thing into a career, Mark? That's a terrific question. And I I think I remember when I came to that realization. When I was 16, which is to say I didn't have my driver's license long, um, I drove about an hour, hour and a half to Akron, Ohio, to hear Og Mandino Mm. speak. And And for those who don't know Og, tell us a little bit about who Og Mandino is. Well, he's probably still one of the uh, best-selling self-help, authors in history. He passed away some years ago, but uh, he basically, his story was he was homeless and living on the street and ready to end his life when he ended up going into a library to get warm and started reading books and then went on to become one of the great influencers. You know, if if your listeners haven't read uh, The Greatest Salesman or The Mm -hmm. Greatest Miracle in the World, uh, those are two of my favorite books that Aug wrote. And when I heard him speak, I had this realization that he was making a living at this. You know, he didn't say, hey, I had to take a day off work delivering mail. You know, that's what he did. He wrote books and gave speeches. And so even though, obviously, at 16, I didn't have much life experience to talk about, I realized that it could be a profession. And that's when I started looking for the resources that would move me in that direction. And what did you find? I found two things. I found the National Speakers Association, which was at the time still a pretty young organization, uh, it, it was designed for uh, aspiring and established speakers, and even as a college student, I got involved with that organization. I also uh, was later, at, at the age of 20, 21, national president of the Future Farmers of America, mm. or FFA. And most people would say, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I spent 320 days that year on the road speaking for and representing the FFA all over the world. Literally, I mean, it was a really heady job for a for a young guy to have, and uh, so that helped me uh, develop my speaking skills. And then something that a lot of people don't know—I I think you know uh, Mike Frank, uh, John, mm-hmm. who used to be in Columbus, Ohio. He's now in uh, North Carolina, but Mike had a speakers bureau, but he also promoted day long events. Today, you'll you know we call them success rallies or achievers events. But Mike would bring in speakers, and to sell tickets to those events, he would send out guys like me to give free speeches for 30 minutes, and our payoff was getting people to buy tickets to this event. So if they liked your speech and got some good ideas, they probably figured, well, shoot, we ought to go yes. to the real deal. We ought to go hear the, the big guys speak. And uh, that's that was very helpful because I learned two things. I, I, I got to you know practice my speaking skills, but I also learned how to sell. So I was very fortunate in that those three things, you know, the FFA and the National Speakers Association and my friendship with Mike Frank uh, just really helped build a, you know, build a fire uh, under my rocket to uh, get me going. You know, I, I think the journey to becoming a speaker or writer is very similar to becoming whatever we are called to be in any facet of life, whether that's a parent, an entrepreneur, a phenomenal nurse, teacher, whatever. Along the way, what were some challenges that you faced, Mark, and uh, and how did you rise above them? You're right, John. I always tell people the two the two prerequisites for success or achievement are first awareness and secondly desire. You know, when I write books, I realize the one thing I can't do is give people you know the awareness or the desire. Uh, somebody asked me recently, you know, when when people read your books, you have a lot of faith that they're going to do what you write about, and I said, well. People generally don't pick up my books unless they're aware of and desire to do what I write about, and unless they're picking the book up to make fun of it. You know, yes. I mean, you know it, it's a self-selecting audience. So I do live by a certain faith because, John, guys like you and I and the people listening to this show, we're self-starters. You know, I can hear a speaker, 
and I can go home and apply an idea or two. Now, not everybody will. You know, some people will just be entertained or inspired momentarily. But I think self-starters are able to take ideas and run with them. For me, the big challenge early on, I went full-time into speaking at the age of 27 after coming out of a brief career in sales and marketing, was my age. Mm. You know, today, we don't think about it because we meet so many younger yes. managers and leaders, especially in startups and tech companies. But 40 years ago, uh, that was pretty unusual. Matter of fact, people hired me off an audio cassette. No video yet. So if someone was interested in hiring you, you sent them a video of a present, or excuse me, an audio tape of a presentation, and if it sounded good, they hired you. Sometimes I'd show up, and the meeting planner would almost yeah. faint. You Where's know, your dad? Like, yeah, exactly. It's like, what have you done with the speaker? And I'm <laughs> right. like, uh, I'm him. And they're like, well, the voice sounds like him, but we thought he'd be much older. But, you know, the good thing about that, John, I, I always tell people I probably operated on 50% pride in my craft and 50% gut-wrenching fear that somebody would jump up in the middle of my speech and yell, BS, you know, yes. or this guy, this guy is a poser, and and that, that's good. It keeps you it keeps you focused. You know, I never took anything for granted. Even to this day, even if I do a a, a free speech for a philanthropy or a charity, I always do my best work because nobody ever says, "Well, you know, he wasn't a very good speaker, but he did it for free." Yeah, you know, agreed, man. Nobody agreed. goes, you know, nobody goes. Well, you know, my my, my service this morning at Starbucks was really bad, but I think the the barista had a had wasn't feeling well. We don't cut people slack like that. By the way, John, I got to tell you, the speaking of living an inspired life, so it's an aside. Let's come back to to your your good questions. I go through my Starbucks every morning. I get my wife her favorite Starbucks drink, and that's how I make my my husbandly points. <laughs> some days, some days I blow them by noon, but but that's how I start. Right. By making come home with another large latte. For yeah, dinner time. yeah. But so I'm I'm going through the drive-through, and this young I get to the window, and this young woman says, "Hey, it's so good to see you again." Now I'll be honest, I did not recognize her, but she was so sincere. I thought maybe she, maybe I have seen her before, and that she's got a better memory than me. And and so I said, "Oh, great! Well, it's great to see you too." And um, well, while, while I'm waiting for my order, I yawn. This is a time of year when I get my system gets really confused as the days start to shorten. And she says, "Oh, you're yawning. Let me tell you about how my morning started, dude." Now, I'm typically still I'm old enough that I don't mind people calling me dude, but I'm not used to it. Yes. And but I thought it was kind of cute because she was kind of you know talking to me like she was talking to a friend. And 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 then I said, "Hey, can I get a straw from you?" And she said, "Here you go, dear." And I thought, what a charming encounter. I left with this big smile on my face and that, A, she was happy to see me, at least she appeared to be. B, she was friendly to kind of, you know, like, let me in on, this is this is my world, and dude, I, I was tired this morning. But then she was, you know, uh, innocently flirting when she said, here you go, dear. And, of course, when you're 20 years old and you give a straw to a guy my age, you know, <laughs> there's no, there's nothing. Your wife remains harm. safe, huh? Yeah, yeah, no kidding, no kidding. So I thought, you know, isn't that interesting how somebody can do, I mean, think about it, handing, taking the uh, money and handing coffee across the, 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 the drive through window, that could be an incredibly dead-end job, and yet here was a young person, I say young relative to me, who really got it. Well, Mark, you said earlier today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote you because I love it, nobody and nothing can stop you from being extraordinary. And yeah. you, you see that in baristas, and sometimes you don't. You see it right. in neighbors and spouses and leaders, and sometimes you don't. Uh, you saw it in kind of an unusual place. Tell me a little bit about the Fred Factor and, and, uh, and where you saw it within that book and the character within it. Yeah, the book came out in 2004, but interestingly, I met Fred back in 1988. That's when uh, I bought my first house in Denver. Fred was my postal carrier. And, you know, the postal service is like any business. There are some really good ones, but there are a whole lot of mediocre and not so good ones. And Fred, when I first met him, and if, if somebody wants to read the story of meeting Fred, the, the book isn't online for free, but the story is they can go to fredfactor.com. And it, it'll give them the whole story about how I met this guy that was just so extraordinary at delivering my mail that we became friends. And I was so inspired by what he did and the lessons that we could learn from him that I wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Fred factor is 
that you can continually create new value for the people you live and work with. And I'm always clear that this isn't a business book. It's not a personal development book. This is a life book. You know, truth is transferable. And the way you develop new value for people is through passion, creativity, and commitment. You know, uh, really enjoying what you do. If you don't enjoy your work, I guarantee you the people around you don't enjoy working with you. Uh, Passion, creativity is about, you know, how do we outthink rather than outspend our competition? Mm -hmm. You know, it's so easy to do that. I think we get so hung up in budgets, and and budgets are important, but, but innovation and creativity are far more powerful. And then commitment. And, and that is, uh, you know, I learned that from my parents. I, I don't think they always liked each other every day, but they were committed to each other. And the commitment carried them through. I tell my kids, you know, when you make a commitment, that doesn't mean when I feel like it. You know, right. It means forever. And I tell you, commitment has saved my, my mangy butt a lot of times when I just did not feel like doing what I said I'd do or or, you know, following through, and I just sucked it up, buttercup, and did it. And the good news is, is that when you stay committed, usually the positive feelings grow out of that commitment. Not necessarily do they fuel the commitment, but they almost always grow out of it. Mark, that that was my introduction into you originally, that, that little book. My father-in-law uh, is a letter carrier himself, so I think there was that extra magnetism toward that subject. But as a writer myself, I always wonder, you know, when, you, when you came up with that topic, did you think, oh, man, this is it. This thing is going to be a runaway success, a national and international bestseller? Or were you writing primarily from a place of passion? Yeah, I was writing from a place of passion. I had, ta- I had uh, talked about Fred from 1988 until 2004 and couldn't get anybody to publish the book. I you know, thought it would be a good book. And the good news is, is my books that have done best have come out of my speeches. My books that have done least well have been books that became speeches. Mm. Uh, I don't know if there's any lesson there, uh, but I had kind of, you know, perfected and developed the, the, the Fred Factor story through my speaking. And um, in, in 2003, my friend Charlie Jones did a little paperback version of the book through Executive Books in Mechanicsville, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. I didn't get any, didn't get any royalties. I didn't get an advance, but I got to buy the book uh, very inexpensively, and it really was, you know, just a nice That's little. Awesome. It was decently done, but it wasn't greatly done. And then a year later, I was speaking um, for a, a group, and long story short, the the publisher of Doubleday Currency at the time heard me and and. Uh, We turned it into, you know, the Fred Factor. I retained the rights, and so I was able to sell the rights. And it came out. It came out in the inspirational Christian market through uh, Waterbrook Press, and then the more commonly known version is Doubleday Currency, which is Random House. Doubleday Currency is gone, but Random House is still the first or second largest publisher in the world. Well, it it is among many of your works, just just outstanding. And you you suggested that folks check it out, and. Listen, I know it's uh, 13 years old at this point, but it's it's relevant and worthy. And what what I wanted to do, Mark, is to share some quotes with you that I love that I've either heard you say from uh, the platform or I've read in your in your words in the books themselves, and for you to tell me what what you're referring to. Okay. Okay. So here we go. There is a massive difference between fame and greatness. Mark Sanborn, what is the massive difference between fame and greatness? Well, fame is based on what you get, and greatness is based on what you give. I always say Lady Gaga is famous. Mother Teresa was great. And that isn't to, uh, to denigrate the creative work of Lady Gaga. But, you know, kids today see famous people, you know, whether it's Floyd Mayweather or Gregor, uh, yes. you know, the, 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 the UFC big, fighter, Gregor yes. McConnell, uh, and and they, they sometimes confuse that fame is what they want. But, you know, we, we do know who famous people are. But a lot of times, great people labor in obscurity. You know, great people don't always become famous. And frankly, famous people aren't always great. So you can lock in greatness. Fame, and eh, it's pretty fickle. You know, I, I know people who are amazing uh, musicians that never became famous. I know people that aren't very good musicians that became famous. Mm-hmm. But greatness is about contribution, and that's where you really, you know, have control. Mm. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing. People, this is the, the second one I wrote down. People love to take credit and they love to place blame. T- tell me what, what you mean when you spoke those words. Well, think about it. When something good happens, half a dozen people raise their hands and take credit for it. And when something bad happens, the room empties out, right? And what I always tell leaders is you don't get full credit until you take full blame or you don't get full credit until you take full responsibility. Um, When you blame a failure on an external circumstance, and, and by the way, there are external circumstances that affect our failure. But if you're always blaming your failure on someone besides yourself, then it's disingenuous when you succeed to go, hey, but that was me. Mm-hmm. You know, if if you had bad luck when you failed, maybe you just had good luck when you succeeded. <laughs> now, now, the secret is if you are a leader, it's good to take responsibility, but give credit. Um, you know, um, there's there's an upside into taking responsibility for your team and always placing credit and, and praise with your team. I always say managers, uh, you know, try to be heroes, but leaders try to make heroes. And to the degree you can help people see how their contribution helped the team succeed, that'll make you a really effective leader. Well, it's a, it's a perfect tie-in to my next quote, actually, which is, good leaders make heroes of others. Yeah, tell me that's about that. Exactly it. You know, uh, I mean, being a hero may impress others, but it won't influence them. You know, letting others see their potential for greatness, or letting others uh, take legitimate credit for what they've done—that's what makes here. You know, makes heroes is people are emboldened, and a lot of people. You know, that idea about nobody can prevent you from choosing to be extraordinary—that's important to give you the back back story on that, and that is that you may not have been raised to be extraordinary. You may not have been encouraged. You may not have been taught. You may not have been rewarded for it. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of environments where people are discouraged from standing out. Mm. And and I always tell people that, you know, you become extraordinary more often in spite of than because of. You know, the people that I know that are really extraordinary, and again, I don't have quantitative data to prove this, but I, I would bet pretty good money that it's because they face some kind of a real challenge or setback. You know, the golden spoon syndrome of just being born lucky, more often than not, that's not true. Tell me what you mean when you say this. We are responsible for living in a way that shows others who we truly are and what we truly believe. Well, you know, in my new book, The Potential Principle, I have a matrix that talks about the inner world and the outer world. And we can only see the outer world. Um, and there are a lot of people who, you know, are, are actors. They are performing in such a way to create the perception that they are someone whom they're not. It's when your inner world and your outer world match. That's what I call integrity. And I say integrity is the distance between your lips and your life. It's the distance between what you think and what you do and uh, what you say and how you behave. So the goal, I think, to be, uh, you know, a person of in integrity to be congruent is that your beliefs and your values, your purpose, your mission manifest themselves in how you do your your work, and that's why you know in the Fred Factor, John, I I, I quote Martin Luther King, who uh, who said, you know, if a man sweeps streets, let him sweep streets as Michael O. Uh, painted, uh, you know, let him sweep streets. Michelangelo painted, let him sweep streets in such a way that all the host of heaven would say, there lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. It's one of my I, favorite I think, quotes, man. I love it. Yeah, I kind of butchered. I left out a little bit of it. So that was the, uh, my, uh, that was the, uh, uh, my paraphrase of Martin Luther King's quote. But the point is, is that it's not the job you have, it's how you do the job. And people go, well, you know, don't tell me that being a street sweeper is the same as being a CEO. It's not the same job, but how you do the job is the same, you know. There's another quote in the book, B.C. Forbes, the founder of Forbes magazine, who said there's, there's uh, more integrity in being a first-rate truck driver than a tenth-rate executive. And I think that points to that, too. As a little tie-in, I, you know, for those who are tuning in for the first time, I was burned at age nine terribly and spent five months in the hospital, but I had a doctor, in, a, in other words, an executive who came in every day, but the person directly behind him, every morning rounding was the janitor. And the doctor would bring in the janitor. He'd sit him in a chair right next to my bed and he'd say, Lavelle, you see this little boy? You are keeping him alive, man. You are keeping him alive. And the, the point 
the doctor was making to the janitor was that infection is likely in burn centers, and it's this guy at minimum wage that's going to keep this patient alive. Not the doctor, not the nurses, not his family. It's it's your role. And he reminded this gentleman named Lavelle to uh, sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted. And, uh, wow. and, and indeed, Lavelle did. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm alive today. Everybody matters, as you so articulately point out through your work. Well, you know, one of my messages to corporate America is, you know, we spend most of our training and development on on senior level leaders or at least middle level up. Yet every time you stay at a hotel, you don't meet a titled leader. Unless you have a problem, you don't meet the general manager, but you meet the bell cap and the front desk and the housekeeper and the, the wait person in the restaurant. Everybody who creates your perception in a hotel is a non-titled leader. So if they don't know what leadership is and how to lead, you're in trouble. Just a couple more quotes. Then I want to hear a little bit about the work that you are launching. And uh, and then I'm going to walk you through the Live Inspired 7. So how about three more quotes? Sure. The only thing better than acknowledgement is action. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a riff on, you know, we can all spot problems, but only a few people can solve problems. Uh, you know, you can acknowledge that you love your spouse, but if you don't show him or her, don't you're not going to take that to the bank. Uh, you know, we have to couple our, our uh, actions with our intentions. And too often, uh, you know, we'll, we'll say something, but we won't do anything about it. And that's fine. Sometimes we're just commenting, but really you want to narrow that gap between what you know you should be doing and what you actually do. Mm. You are the spark that sets others on fire when you initiate. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like my Starbucks gal this morning. Um, (laughs) She she improved the quality of my day. Now, if I was a a truly uh, mature and uh, (laughs) successful human being, I would not depend on others to do that. But the reality is, you know, others can either intentionally or inadvertently encourage us or discourage us. And who wouldn't want to have that kind of experience first thing in the morning when they go to get their coffee? So she was a spark, you know, and hopefully, in a way, I guess it already has carried over because I thought enough of it, you know, to share that anecdote with like, you well, and your your listeners. You know, I hope next time you're in the drive through and you see that familiar face uh, and her saying, OK, dude, that you let her know that there are thousands and thousands and thousands who are influenced now today because of her. Directly. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. I hope, I hope to see her again so I can tell her that. All right, the the final quotes, and these are all from Mark Sanborn, and they're from various videos that I've seen, various books that I've read, all of them worthy. This is a short, truncated list that I've written down on my own laptop, is the test of leadership is, is anything or anyone better because of you? So, Mark, what do you mean by that one? The test of leadership is this, is anything or anyone better because of you? Well, what that means is don't confuse ambition with leadership. You know, I got nothing against ambition. I'm a capitalist, and I think as long as it's legal and ethical and moral, ambition is a wonderful thing. But if what you do only improves your life, you haven't really led anything. It's when the leader's efforts benefit the greater good that I think leadership becomes reality. Now, it's it's often a win-win. You know, you can be more successful when you help your team be more successful. Or, as my pal Larry Winget says, you know, uh, you will succeed when you are of greater and largest, larger service in helping others get what they need and succeed. Mm. But leadership is always about making things better. Managers maintain, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but if you look up the root word to management, it literally means to maintain. And maintain, maintenance is different than growth. You know, leaders help people become better than they were. Leaders help organizations achieve new things they didn't achieve before. And that, to me, is the real test of leadership. You are still so passionate about leadership and people, processes, potential. Uh, And I guess that's why you just keep cranking out worthy stuff, including (laughs) this most recent book. Tell me about the new book. Yeah, the potential principle, how to narrow the gap between how good you are and how good you could be. Really, John, what it came out of is the last 31 years of developing processes to help really successful people get better. Now, the book's for anybody. You want a process to go from where you are to where you want to be, the book will help. But really, it's aimed at people who are already pretty successful achievers because the rub, as you know, is that the better you become, the harder it is to get better. Now, the first day you ski... It's not hard to become better the second day you ski. If you go five feet the first day without falling and you go 10 feet the second That's day right. without Double falling, baby. 
Yeah, but when you become an expert skier, it's a whole lot harder to to get better than that. And so what I always tell people, the premise of the book is is very simple. We all know how good we've become, but none of us know how good we could be. And that, to me, is one of the cool things. You wake up in the morning, it doesn't matter how cruddy or good yesterday was. God gives you a chance to try it all again today. Mm. And if you don't take advantage of that opportunity and try to achieve a little bit more of your potential, man, you're missing one of the great opportunities of life. Mark Sanborn, when people hear you speak, and now there have been 2,500-plus audiences around the world— Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of books have been purchased and read. But when they hear you speak or read your book, what's the one thing you hope that we do better afterwards? Well, I hope two things. One, I hope that I expand people's awareness of what's possible for them and and for the organizations where they work. And then number two, I give them some very practical tools. You know, just uh, my pastor at my church, We I went to a church with the same pastor for for. 25 years. And we got a new pastor and he's a lot younger and he's very different in his style. But one of the things I really admire about him is that if you hear him speak for 30 minutes on Sunday, Wednesday, you'll remember what you were supposed to do. Hmm. Now, if you hear a pastor speak for 30 minutes, he can inspire you and bring you to tears and and do lots of great things. But if by Wednesday, you don't have anything you can do with the message there's limited value in that. So, I, you know, I try to be practical. I, I always say my goal is to write little books about big ideas. I'm a boiled down artist. You know, I want to give people the essence so they don't have to read, you know, 200,000 words to get an idea or two. So I would say expand people's awareness of what is possible and give them the tools to pursue that. Mm. So we're going to shift gears just a little bit into what we call the Live Inspired Seven. Mark Sandburn, these are seven questions that we have asked every guest that has ever graced us on the Live Inspired podcast couch. You being one of them now, man. So number one, what is the best book? And I know you've written and read a whole bunch, but what is the best book you've ever read? Well, I'm going to hedge I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit. You know, as a person of faith, I, I really can't just skip over the Bible. I mean, that, you know, is, is the underpinning of my worldview. I know not everyone uh, agrees with that, but that would certainly be uh, right up near the top. Um, the other thing is um, there was a, a book of fiction that for some reason really impacted me called uh, The River Why. And I think the author's name was uh, Erickson, but I'm not sure. And uh, that's a pretty esoteric reference, but it's one of the greatest works of fiction. And I think, by the way, we can learn as much from fiction as we can nonfiction if it's really good fiction. So the river why. Tomorrow, you discover that your wealthy uncle has shockingly died back in Ohio at 103, leaving you with millions. What would you do with that newfound wealth? First, I wouldn't tell anybody because then everybody would be asking for a handout. Uh, I think I would meet with my financial planner and make sure that <laughs> two things that, you know, my my family's needs were met, uh, that they at least had enough to get by. You never want to give your kids so much that they don't need to do anything. You want to give them enough money so they can do they can do anything, but you don't want to give them enough money that they don't do anything. Yes. Uh, then the second thing I would look at is, you know, in the runway I got left in my life, how to invest that money in a way that would outlive me. I'm not going to be around that long in the scheme of history, but uh, the, the, the places that I spend that money investing in others and institutions, that could positively impact people a very long time. If your house caught fire and all living things and all living uh, animals, people, are out, you have an opportunity to run in and grab one thing, one item. What would you grab? Well, that's a good question. I'm really not a, a thing guy. I'm not really, I, I, as I've gotten older, I've tried to give away as much stuff as possible. I've, I've given away several thousand books. My library is down to less than 200 from, at one time, maybe 4,000. Hmm. You know, I would say... Uh, I'd probably be able to get a pretty big armful of books out of my uh, my library at home if that were the case. Uh, you know, the other thing is my wife is the keeper of mementos, and mm-hmm. I'm not even sure I could find where all of the the family. Uh, I, I guess I guess I would help her carry out the iMac that has thousands and thousands of photos that she's taken over the years. That would be the other thing. Smart grab. Uh, if you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach and have a long conversation with anyone, 
living or dead, who would you want to be hanging out with on that gorgeous day? You know, I'd, I'd really dig talking to the Apostle Paul. I really relate to Paul because he said he was the chief of sinners, and yet he was one of the greatest influencers of the Christian faith. So I can relate to a really flawed guy yes. who's doing his best to, to do what he thinks is the right thing to do. Perfect. What's the best advice that, whether it was Paul or anyone else, ever gave you? A uh, state congressman in Ohio once told me at a very young age, whenever you give a speech, whether it's a eulogy or an after-dinner speech, people always want to be entertained. Uh, I've I've, uh, adjusted that a bit. I believe a better word than entertained is engaged, because certainly at a eulogy, you want to engage people to honor whoever is being eulogized. But if you don't have something of interest that engages people, then your words fall on deaf ears. Mm. Two more. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? Lighten up. You know, I was a pretty intense dude. I still can be a pretty intense dude, and I know I've lived long enough to know that I would say be, be very serious about what you do, but don't take yourself too seriously. And I think I've, uh, I've been prone to that a bit, so I would hope my 20-year-old self might believe me. Mark Sanborn, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? Uh, If you want to be successful, do whatever you do a little bit better than anyone else who did it by working a little bit harder than anybody else worked. That's kind of been my strategy. Uh, I I know that uh, I, I won't go down in history as the best anything, but I can go down in history as a highly successful person who was willing to work hard. And that's really what I want to be known for, is that I was willing to work hard. I may not have been the smartest, best looking, able to jump the highest, but I was willing to put in the work. Brother, one of your mentors, a guy who inspired your career, and uh, one of my favorite authors, Ogmandino, wrote that I will love the light, for it shows me the way, yet I will endure the darkness because it shows me the stars. And Mark Sanborn, I think you in our industry and you in our world are a wonderful living example of doing both, man. So thank you for showing us the light and the dark and the way forward. Well, thank you for those kind words. I I very much appreciate it. And, John, keep up the great work you do. It's been a treat to have a chance to share with uh, both you and your listeners. My friends, for this time and until next time, that was Mark Sanborn. This is John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired. Well, my friends, I hope that you had an open mind, an open heart, open eyes, open ears, and maybe even most importantly on that one, because there was so much content in Open Journal. That was Mark Sanborn, like I just said. He is a best selling author, a world class speaker, and a phenomenal human being. Shared an awful lot during our time together. But but maybe the highlight from that is this quote that you've heard now twice. You're gonna hear it a third time. Maybe it's worth remembering. Here it is. Nobody and nothing can stop you from being extraordinary, regardless, my friends, on your citizenship, on your birthright, on your gender, on your challenges, on your financial situation, on your job, on your status, on your level of feeling great about yourself today. It it, it doesn't matter because nobody and nothing can stop you from being extraordinary, extraordinary. We spent the majority of the podcast after that quote was shared unpacking what truly being extraordinary looks like in action. And I hope it has inspired you to realize that you can make a difference, that you are a change agent for good, whether you are a barista or whether you are the CEO, man. You, we, we, through our lives, through our actions and our words, can profoundly touch the lives of those around us. We're going to have all of this and more in the show notes, including a link to Mark's new book. You will want to check it out. You can see the show notes and you can follow all of my work. The videos are book on fire, social media links, etc. at johnolearyinspires.com. That's johnolearyinspires.com. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I love and enjoy bringing it to you, do me a favor. Take a moment now to send out an email, a post online, tell a friend that you're seated close to, tell that stranger sitting next to you on the bus right now about Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Let's tell them about this podcast. Let's remind them that in spite of some challenges, the best days in their journey and in our journey remain in front of us. 
for this time. And until next time, this is John O'Leary, and this is your day. Live Inspired.